largest demonstration against the Vietnam War by Chicanos. A lot of people weren't comfortable doing the Black Panther, carrying the rifles in the street type of thing, but they didn't have a problem going out there and screaming and hollering. Nearly 30,000 Chicanos marched in protest, then gathered together for music and speeches. As Los Angeles police tried to clear the area, the peace rally turned into a riot. Tear gas and beatings left hundreds injured. Dozens were arrested. Three were killed, including noted LA Times journalist Ruben Salazar. It was sort of a turning point. They came in and disrupted a peaceful protest. And I think a lot of people then started thinking, We're, something else is going on here. The aftermath of the L.A. moratorium motivated more Chicanos to join with their fellow Americans in the anti-war movement. Others swelled the ranks of the Crusade for Justice and the United Farm Workers. Early civil rights organizations, LULAC in the late 1920s and the American GI Forum in the late 1940s, set the stage for new organizations, such as La Raza and the Brown Berets. It was like, we don't need the police in our neighborhood, you know, we'll do it ourselves. The Brown Berets began as a militant security detail. It transformed itself into a force for social change. We started taking responsibility, not just blaming, not just demonstrating, but providing a service to our community, dealing with racism, dealing with fair housing. We started supporting the farm workers on their boycotts and the demonstrations against Safeways, against Coors. And at that time, I think we were boycotting so many different things, you couldn't buy almost anything. These were all positive actions that were taking place. Colorado Chicanas and Chicanos were united in their quest for self-determination in education, employment, and politics. In 1970, the Crusade for Justice sponsored its second National Chicano Youth Liberation Conference. 3,000 people attended from 15 states, double from the previous year. Attendees passed a resolution in favor of a third political party for Chicanos, La Raza Unida, the United People. We're not developing politicos, we're developing a party, we're developing a platform. We'll be educating our people to the uh, fallacy of a two-party system, which is one monster with two heads that eats from the same trough. As Malcolm X said in one of his speeches, to uh, determine who's going to end up in the White House and who's going to end up in the doghouse, you know. And that's the position that we want to be placed in. Chicano activists ran for local and state office. Al Gurule ran for governor. Here in Colorado, we wanted to get 10% of the vote to become an established party. And we never made that goal. We just got like 3% of the vote. La Raza Unida's national convention was held in El Paso, Texas, 1972. Many Coloradans traveled to the convention, including UMAS activist and leader Ricardo Falcón. While driving through New Mexico, Falcón's car overheated. The car pulled into a gas station run by white supremacist Perry Brunson. They jump out of the car, they're trying to cool the radiator. Perry Brunson walks out of the gas station and he says, uh, we don't waste water here. And so there, Ricardo approaches him and says, it's not a problem, we'll pay for the water. You know, we just, we've had, we have this issue with the radiator. And so then he turns around and he says, you Chicano mother are all alike. And he walks into his gas station and then Freddie and Ricardo talk a little bit about, this is gonna be a bad situation, what shall we do? Ricardo says, I'll go in and I'll pay. So as Ricardo's approaching the doorway to the gas station there, Brunson is, reaches under the counter, he pulls out a 38 and he uh, fires into Ricardo point blank and he shoots him. And then a state patrol comes to my house and says, while your husband has died, has passed away, 
And so you should probably, I don't even remember what he said to me. I, all I know is that Ricardo had died. I think that was a defining moment for me in terms of what, of what it means to, to be a soldier in the movement. I also had a report that Colorado is wearing the black armbands in mourning for Ricardo Falcón. I'm Francisco Martinez, and I'm an attorney. I'm one of the team that have been investigating this matter. I know, I know in my heart and in my soul that my husband was murdered. The town of Oro Grande and Alamogordo helped Mr. Brunson in every way they could with the murder because no attempt, no attempt of any sort of help was given to my husband. He was murdered in Alamogordo over water. And how do I explain this to my son? I remember saying when Falcon died, that man made the mistake that he, he thought he'd killed just another Mexican. He doesn't, he didn't realize that he killed a Mexican who has power behind him and people behind him. This won't go away, we won't forget. Here we were on our way to a conference and we ended up organizing around a murder. <laughs> La Raza Unida was considered an impossible dream. And this is a historic day for everyone that's here. So the question was always, is it really a political party where we're trying to get people elected? Or is it just a platform to speak about the Chicano issues? We thought, well, you know what? Everything is up for grabs, everything. The Democrats have not done anything for, for Mexican people. The Republicans have not done anything. And you know what? We know our issues. We can, we can create a political party. There was not one thing that we could not do uh, in, within the context of community and the Chicano movement. Colorado came here to take part in unity. Vying for national party chairman was Corky Gonzalez from Colorado, Reyes Lopez Tijerina from New Mexico, and Jose Angel Gutierrez from Texas. Gutierrez was an effective organizer who generated political victories, especially in Crystal City, Texas. In behalf of the Colorado delegation, in the memory of Ricardo Falcón, Colorado cast 39 votes <coughs> for Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I cannot listen to you Mr. unless the delegation is sitting down. After a contentious vote, the leadership of party chairman was awarded to Jose Angel Gutierrez. The three leaders got up, locked hands, and said, we're together, united, and that was about the last time you ever saw those three men together again. It lasted for eight years, nine years, that where it was really kind of active, and then it just kind of uh, came apart. We weren't really as successful as we wanted to be, but we let them know that, uh, you know, we were a force to be dealt with. On a winter day in 1973, the American Indian Movement reclaimed part of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, known as Wounded Knee. The crusade for justice was suspected of supplying weapons to activists at Wounded Knee. Tensions escalated between law enforcement and crusade members. In March of that year, a confrontation between Luis Junior Martinez and a Denver police officer resulted in death. Known as the St. Patrick's Day Massacre, the police officer was shot three times, once in the face. Martinez was shot twice and died. An hour later, an explosion ripped through the apartment building where Martinez had been staying, adjacent to the crusade headquarters. Denver police blamed the explosion on the crusade for justice. The crusade blamed the police as payback for their support for wounded knee. The next day, the building was demolished, proving neither claim.
The 1970s El Movimiento continued with confrontations, showdowns, and sometimes more tragedy. In spring of 1974, at the University of Colorado at Boulder, activists took over temporary building number one, TB1, headquarters of UMAS's Educational Opportunity Program. After a series of meetings, we came to the conclusion that our worst enemy on the campus had been the administration of the program that was supposed to be helping us. The real issue was financial aid. We felt that the activists opened the doors, deserved to be there like everybody else. So we went in there about 7 o'clock in the morning, there's eight of us. We threw all the desks we could find down the stairwell uh, and barricaded ourselves on the third floor. Food was sent uh, by the Crusade for Justice. Other people brought food. It was like a potluck. Uh, we slept on floors. We lived in the building. I think one of the things that we don't do in the movement is we don't laugh uh, enough. And something that made me laugh was about the fourth day of this occupation, we were going, man, you stink, you know? Cause we hadn't even brought a toothbrush, a change of clothes, underwear, anything. So anyway, we're like, I'm gonna take a sponge bath. And says, yeah, but you can put on the same old clothes and then you know you can wash those clothes, but what are you gonna wear while you're washing them? And we had this big dilemma and, and some, somebody opened up this big locker and says, well, look at this. And we had a dance group. We had all these great chato outfits and big dresses like the girls wear that looked like butterflies. And so, all, <laughs> so for the day that we were doing our little laundry, we're all dressed like chatos, man. We look cool. We all look like Zapata and Pancho Villa. And we're, we're, we got these great dance costumes with conchos and stuff. It was great. I mean, it's, and I just, it's one of my favorite memories of the occupation of TB1. <laughs> Police SWAT teams circled TB1. University officials refused to negotiate. Weeks into the standoff, with no end in sight, several students took matters into their own hands. They armed themselves with explosives. On May 27, 1974, dynamite detonated inside a parked car at Chautauqua Park. Killed were Neva Arlene Romero, Una Jacola, and Reyes Paul Martinez. Within 48 hours, another parked car exploded. Three more people perished. Heriberto Teran, Francisco Dardi, and Florencio Freddy Granado. Antonio Alcantar survived, but was seriously injured. The dead are known as Los Seis de Boulder, the Six of Boulder. It was frightening. These were close, personal friends, and they were gone. The official conclusion? Los Seis de Boulder mishandled the dynamite. The unofficial conclusion? Murder. I don't doubt that they intended to possess explosives. What I doubt is that, that they detonated them and, and accidentally killed themselves. I believe they were set up. That's personal theory. You know, Freddy Granado and I were going to come to Pueblo and start a newspaper as soon as I graduated, and I graduated that spring, and then he got killed. And for the last 30 years, I think about those people just about every day, and I consciously say, I'm going to do something that they didn't get a chance to do. They gave their lives for the movement, but wherever they are today, they need to know that there are people like myself and all my four daughters and hundreds and thousands of young people that took up where they left off. Three decades later, annual memorials still celebrate the soldiers of the Colorado Chicano movement. Included, Los Seis de Boulder, Luis Junior Martinez, and Ricardo Falcón. Although I think some historians think or have a perception that um, rebellion started in the 60s in urban areas like Denver and Pueblo, Albuquerque and LA, within the context of Colorado, 
Areas like the San Luis Valley were fertile ground for rebellion. In the San Luis Valley of southern Colorado lies La Sierra, the mountain. The ownership of La Sierra has been disputed since 1960. We settled that community in the mid-1800s, and we lived off the land. There's no way that my ancestors, my great-grandparents, my grandparents, my parents could have survived without the resources on that mountain. There's no way that you can live in the lowlands in this elevation with 8 to 10 inches annually of rainfall without accessing the uplands. The uplands where all the wildlife were, where the fish were, where everything that you needed it was a cornucopia. Heirs of original settlers of San Luis claimed La Sierra for themselves and based their legal right on the 1863 Bovien document. That 1863 Bovian document basically stated that the original settlers of San Luis, of the Culebra, would have the rights to that mountain and that those rights were to be held in perpetuity. In 1960, property owner Jack Taylor fenced off La Sierra from the townspeople. That's when all hell broke loose. They were going to hang Jack Taylor. Um, they shot into the jail. I mean, it was a riot. So, you know, that was before there was a Chicano movement. And I saw that as a teenager. It stayed in my mind. It's in my mind. It's embedded in my mind. And one of the things that I want to make real clear is that our rights come before the rights of the owner because the mountain is subservient to the land. My husband and I started the Land Rights Council in 1977. Our ultimate goal was to regain access to the mountain and the historic use rights. Those rights included hunting, 